Everybody has their little pet shows, their guilty pleasures that they watch even though many people think it's terrible. It's the sort of crap that may air late at night on the sci-fi network, right between Sharknado and Frankenfish. Truer things have never been said. For many people growing up in the 1960s, that guilty pleasure was a poorly rated show that was cancelled after just two seasons before a letter writing event was able to bring it back for a third season, after which it was promptly cancelled again. And yes, not even I like the original series. I'm like, it, 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 it's kind of bad. It's kind of bad. Let's start in the 90s. Or 1989, 1987. When did Star Trek The Next Generation come along? The good one. At a time when there was literally only three television channels to choose from, this show couldn't even finish off in the top 50 shows that aired that season. It was not until it began airing in syndication in the 1970s that it would gain the cult following that it has today. We are, of course, talking about Star Trek. Star Trek is home to all sorts of future technology that oh, we wish we had, like warp drives and food replicators. It's also home to future technology technology that we probably don't want, like teleporters, the ultimate death machine, which we addressed in a previous video. It's, you, you don't use that. Don't, if some magical alien comes along and says, I've got a teleporter, be like, Fuck no, bring down the shuttle, bitch. I'm not getting in that death machine. No way. Dr. Pulaski was right. If you haven't already seen our episodes on how far from a warp drive we are and why you don't want to be torn atom by atom by a transporter, be sure to check out those videos after this video because shameless self-promotion is what makes my world go round. Look, while a lot of the cool gadgets from Star Trek remain totally out of reach, look, don't worry, transporters ain't coming anytime soon. You're safe for now. There are, however, quite a few that have become reality. Today we're going to be taking a look at a few things that seemed futuristic when they first appeared on television in 1966, yet a totally commonplace today. <laughs> Removable storage. Sometimes the ideas we see in science fiction are pretty straightforward. They take something that already exists and just imagine it just a little bit better, or imagining a new use for it, or just making it really small. Such is the case with Star Trek and their removable storage, the fancy term for floppy disks and USB drives. Now, this wasn't much of a stretch of the imagination for the creators of the show. Magnetic tape was used for reel-to-reel -reel audio recordings in the 1930s. In the 1950s, people realized that this same medium could be used to store not only audio but also video information, resulting in the invention of the videotape recorder. This uh, was different from the VHS tapes that you might be familiar with and it was only for industry use but it's the same principle. And if magnetic tape could be used to store both audio and video then why couldn't it be used to store pure data? Uh, we now know that it can and honestly it seems pretty obvious but this was non-existent future tech in 1966. The first floppy disk drive wouldn't go into R&D until 1967 and it wasn't released until 1971. <laughs> 1.49 must have been less back in the day. I remember floppy disks when I reckon were 1.44 megabytes of storage, which is a joke today. <laughs> Tablets. Touchscreen technology was first developed in 1965, so Star Trek isn't going to claim credit for that. However, they do get to claim credit for inventing the original tablet in the form of personal access display devices, or PADS. Of course, they are never once referred to by that name in any television series or movie, instead being referred to as things like a data slate or even just paper. That's not a tablet, that's not an iPad, that's my data slate. I'm bringing it back. The first official reference to the term PAD seems to have come from a tiny excerpt in the fourth edition of the Star Trek Encyclopedia released in 2016. Whatever the creators felt like calling them at the time, there is no denying that the pads were an accurate prediction of various tablets. From Kindles to iPads, these devices were portable, roughly the size of a tablet, and were often seen as being interfaced with the ship's computer, the way you might connect your tablet to another device via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Interestingly, there are a couple of things that Star Trek seems to have gotten very wrong with regards to tablets. First is the timeline. Predicting the future is hard. So we can't really fault them for this one. However, they were extremely conservative with their estimates and predicted that these would not become commonplace until sometime in the 22nd century. This is, this is only a hundred years wrong, best case. Not only did we develop them faster than expected, but our tablets are far superior to the ones used on Star Trek, or so it would seem. Not only did they occasionally refer to their pads as paper, but they seemed to treat them as such as well. Our modern tablets are essentially full-on computers, and on the show they seem to serve individual functions. It was not uncommon to see someone with a stack of tablets on their desk, each for a different purpose. One may have navigation data on it, while another could just be a novel that the character was reading for pleasure. 
amateur tablet use. In fairness to the creators, data storage was pretty shit at the time. When the show began, the world's first ever 8-inch floppy drives weren't even being developed yet, so we can forgive them for thinking that a single tablet holding the entire text of War of Beasts would be impressive, even if that was the only thing that the tablet could do. Addictive and predatory mobile games. This entry comes from Star Trek The Next Generation, my favorite Star Trek, and it's a reminder that not all future tech is a good thing. The writers of the show were extremely out of their time with this one, and they'd probably be disappointed to discover just how accurate their prediction was. The 106th episode of TNG is titled The Game. It's a classic-ish episode where Riker returns from vacation on a pleasure planet with a highly addictive augmented reality game. He gets the rest of the crew of the Enterprise addicted to the game as well, classic Riker, and is up to everyone's least favorite character ever, Wesley Crusher, classic Wesley, to save the day with the help of his new love interest, Ashley Judd. It seems like such a strange and goofy premise for an episode, especially since Star Trek wasn't the kind of show to go around blaming the evils of society on video games and rock music. In the show, the game was able to be so addictive by stimulating the pleasure centers of the brain each time the player completed a level, though how it got right here to spread the game to the rest of the ship is unclear. I can tell you how. Look at many people playing mobile games and how do you think they heard about them? Word of mouth. Riker's just spreading it word of mouth. This is exactly the same way that free-to-play mobile games are designed today. Games are specifically designed to create addiction by releasing tiny hits of dopamine, and they incentivize players spreading it to their friends with in-game rewards. The ultimate goal of the game in Star Trek wasn't entirely clear, but here in the real world, it's money, baby. Calls hard cash. Everyone's favorite AR game, Pokemon, roast nearly a billion dollars in 2020, the fifth year since the game's release and its most profitable ever. It turns out that engineering a game specifically for the purpose of being addictive is extremely effective to the point that there have been pushes to make the free-to-play game model illegal. While Star Trek may have accidentally hit the nail on the head with the game, it was society that dropped the ball on this one. You saw a TV show that featured an entire planet dedicated to hedonistic pleasure and instead of working towards that, you decided that you should make a free-to-play monetized game. Brilliant work, world. Thank you. Video conferencing. Technically, the first video call took place at the 1964 World's Fair two years before Star Trek premiered. However, it would not become commercially available until 1970, and even then, it barely was. It was far from successful, and people didn't really know what to do with it. The idea of video calls may have already existed, but Star Trek was the first one to actually show a practical use for it. It's all too common in any iteration of the show for the captain to request an incoming communication to be put on screen. We could watch his characters would talk to one another by looking directly at their screens. They probably didn't realize it, but they had solved the problem that would plague video phone companies for decades to come. The issue with video phones is that no one, including the people marketing them, really had any idea what the hell to do with them. How do you get someone to stare at a screen on the phone connected to their wall or sitting on their nightstand while they have a conversation? The answer is you just don't. What Star Trek understood was that the key wasn't to put the screen on a phone, it was to make the phone part of the screen that someone was already staring at. Virtual assistants. Typing can be a bit of a pain in the ass. Even though Star Trek was already predicting widespread use of touchscreen technology, that still required the use of their hands, which could be better used for other things. Oh, why waste your time with something so cumbersome when you could just tell the computer what you wanted to do? Voice recognition technology was first being developed in 1971, but when Star Trek premiered, it was still just pure science fiction. Not only could the ship's computer accept voice commands, but the communication was a two-way street. The computer could both take orders and respond to questions, though it didn't really engage in any small talk. Fast forward to the present, and this technology has become part of many people's daily lives. A unreliable part of their lives. I'm often yelling at Siri, and it's, it's just not. It's like, we've sent results to your iPhone that are completely irrelevant. Thanks, Siri. Thanks, Siri. What it is good for is turning off all these lights and stuff. All of my studios automated, and I love that shit. The computers on Star Trek are everything that we wish Siri and Alexa were. They could understand what people were saying, and they gave useful information beyond the top Google result for the question it thought you asked, but definitely didn't. Nailed it, Kevin, who wrote the script. Currently, virtual assistants still leave a lot to be desired, though the majority of that is just the result of the limitations of available voice recognition technology. Once our devices can actually understand what we're saying, they'll finally do what we f***ing tell them to, instead of just pulling up reviews for our local Chinese takeout restaurants when we didn't ask for that in any way whatsoever. F***. 
necessary. Sadly, no matter how advanced our virtual assistants get, it's a near certainty that we'll never be able to say T or Grey hot and have a cup of tea magically appear. This is very sad, and now I'll do you a wonderful favor. Alexa, play Despacito. Despacito. Enjoy the future, everybody! Bluetooth earbuds. As we said earlier, one of the keys for sci-fi future tech is to take something that already exists and then make it better. Telephones existed, but holding the receiver either required using one of your hands or holding your neck at an uncomfortable angle and hoping the phone just didn't fall away. This problem had already been solved by the time Star Trek aired, and hands-free headsets were already common among telephone operators and other professions. But what if the design could be even better? First, that cord has got to go. Cords are a pain in the arse, and nobody likes to be tethered to a location like that. That. The earliest devices that were referred to as wireless headphones already existed, but these were just portable battery-powered radios that used headphones instead of a speaker. The increased versatility of a wireless headset was a natural inevitability, but we'll give Star Trek some points for this easy prediction. More importantly, they chose to ditch the headset altogether, instead giving Ahura the equivalent of a Bluetooth earbud. The only real difference between her earbud and modern-day versions is that instead of wrapping around the ear to be held in place or being extremely small to the point of being nearly invisible, her as earbud jutted straight out from her ear. This is a pretty bizarre design decision, but it was also a prop for a TV show. Having the earpiece be so small that it couldn't be seen would force viewers to use their imagination, and at that point we may as well have been reading books instead of watching TV like idiots. A device that wrapped around the ear would have been visible and made more sense, but perhaps they just didn't think that would look futuristic enough. Mobile phones. Finally, the example you almost certainly already know, as apparently any video on this topic is legally required to include it, and that's of course mobile phones. The communicators from Star Trek not only predicted mobile phones, they directly inspired them. The original communicator resembled a flip phone, and Motorola engineer Martin Cooper has explicitly stated that the show inspired him to design the world's first mobile phone, originally demonstrated in 1973. Early phones were enormously bulky and looked nothing like the beloved Star Trek communicators, but it was only a matter of time before that changed. While not the first flip phone on the market, when Motorola released the first flip phone in 1996, they named it the Motorola StarTac. An obvious but legally distinct nod to the classic science fiction show that inspired both the original technology and the new design. Now, most of these technologies were not the invention of Star Trek writers. In fact, none of them probably were. Though they may have existed in science fiction long before Kirk first boarded the Enterprise, it was Star Trek from which they are best known. That, or for, you know, being real things that actually exist now. The show may not have been the original source of these ideas, but it is what brought the ideas into the mainstream consciousness. We spent a lot of time on this channel telling you either how impossible the things you want are, or how at the very least you'll never see them in your lifetime, and we're sorry about that, but it's nice to take the time now and then to remember that not everything from science fiction remains fiction. Thanks for watching.